I ended up getting hundreds of DMs and even some emails from people who had actually like worked with Jeffree Star before or was around him during his MySpace era, all wanting to share like little bits of information. In his interview with both Chris Henson and Davi, he blatantly lied. Some of Jeffree Star's victims confirmed. Because I have dirt on everyone and they know to keep their mouths shut. Is this the dirt he was talking about? This website is no longer up and available because it was actually taken down by the FBI girl. This is some serious shit. What does all this actually mean? All right, hi fairies. So this video is going to be a follow-up to my first video about Jeffree Star. Oh Lord, again. So that video kind of popped off. Jesus Christ. It originally just started out as a small little project I wanted to share with you, but a lot of people seem to like it and find it really informative. But one of the biggest critiques of that video was what was the purpose of it? You did this for what? A lot of people were wondering what's the point of a video like this. And I kind of agree. I honestly really don't fucking know what the point of that video was. But it really started to get me thinking because I don't really like doing drama or tea videos, but I don't mind doing commentary videos. I ended up getting hundreds of DMs and even some emails from people who had actually like worked with Jeffree Star before or was around him during his MySpace era, all wanting to share like little bits of information. And I know that's hot, hot tea and exclusive receipts. Very good tea. And I could easily just spill all the beans to you, but it made me wonder what more could I be doing and how can I separate myself from drama and tea channels? And then while I was shitting, like yesterday at five o'clock, <laughs> I just remembered I'm minoring in anthropology, but within my anthropology courses, I had to write something called an ethnography. I had to write multiple of them. So an ethnography is a scholarly summary description as well as theory of a cultural practice. Etho in the name stands for ethnic. And I've done quite a few of those. I usually do them on Latin American culture. Like my one of my personal favorites is my one I did on Day of the Dead. <laughs> But a big part of ethnographies is the fieldwork. It's the actual research phase. It's not just a speculative essay. You also have to describe something and give facts and observations. So I thought to myself, why don't I use the exclusive tea and receipts I got, as well as my presence here on the platform, to create an ethnography for the star family and that part of the internet, the culture of that part of the internet. I wish I was taking an anthro class this semester, because girl, I would have gotten an A on this final. Look at all the research I did. I'm just taking bio and astronomy this semester, so rats. Ah! This video is going to be structured like a typical ethnography essay, which means the first part is going to be the fieldwork phase. That's the part with the description, observations, and factual evidence. So if you're just here for the tea, don't you worry, girl, you're gonna get it straight up. But once we've laid out things I'm going to reference later on, I will then go into an analysis of his community, as well as an analysis of cancel culture itself, all while doing my makeup because I have to make this gay somehow. Uh, oh. What's it say? Queen. So let's get started. My pussy smells like cat food. So after the first video, I received a tip from a person that wishes to remain anonymous. We are going to pretend we didn't hear that. And the story begins with a website called isanyoneup.com. Now, isanyoneup was actually a revenge porn website, which means users would anonymously upload pornographic videos and images of basically people they didn't like. So if your ex cheats on you, you upload his dick pic there. It's what she deserves. Now, this website is no longer up and available because it was actually taken down by the FBI girl. This is some serious shit. Ooh. But while it was up, it was very popular amongst the kind of scene emo rocker thing, basically what Jeffree Star was involved with back then. So in this video, Video, just like the last one, we're gonna be using the Wayback Machine. So I was originally sent a link to a, what appeared to be a blog post on Is Anyone Up? Which is strange because most of the time it's just like a porn video, you know? So this blog was posted on May 22nd, 2011, and it is called Some of Jeffree Star's Victims Confirm. Whoa, hold up, partner. <laughs> Now that we have that out of the way, basically this blog post just contains a bunch of pictures of people. I have no idea who they are. I don't know who this man is. But the comments of this blog post is what is really interesting to me. Even though he wasn't hugely relevant back then, if his allegations weren't true, a lot of the comments would say, hey, this isn't true. You know, because this was a publicly accessible forum. So if it wasn't true, people would be saying it's not true in the comments. In fact, a majority of them are saying shit like, oh yes, Jeffrey, get that straight guy dick. Sucking dick and cock. Just some faggot shit like that. Ooh. I need to watch my 
mouth. This is scholarly material. Sheer jam. Most of the comments are just kind of funny and cute to read, but some of them are actually suggestive of a much more darker scenario going on. Why don't we all take a look? The comment made by Shark Bates on May 22nd, 2011 reads, Anyone that's fucked Jeffrey is gross, forced or not. Dude ladies, a complete whore in the worst sense possible. But I wouldn't doubt if those rumors about Jeffrey taking advantage of people are true. Wait a damn minute. Another comment made by I'm the bitch on the same day reads, Jeffrey gets guys drunk and takes advantage of them. He's even tried to rape some people, so yeah, victims would definitely be a good choice of words for this. This is crazy. And then the comment below that made by shit son says, proof question mark. Then I'm the bitch replies, supposedly one time he had some e-celeb guy come out to Cali and stay with him. When he wouldn't hook up with him, after Jeffrey kept trying, he kicked him out. Now this is well over a year or two ago, so no, I'm sorry, I don't have proof from what I've been told by other people that know him. I don't keep little files on my computer of people just in case. You can believe me or not. I really don't give a fuck, haha. -ha. So if you want proof about Jeffree Star's involvement with this website, then I'm happy to oblige. There are tweets from Jeffree Star's own Twitter, the one he still uses today, in which he adds is anyone up. And it wasn't just Jeffree being a user of this website. He would also upload uh, videos of people without their consent. A tweet made on December 3rd, 2010 says, I have about five pages of band guy nudes for you is anyone up. We got you. So right there, he quite literally admits to uploading these pictures of people. And another tweet he made on March 16th, 2011, he's replying to Frank Mus Musket. I'm sorry, I don't know who that is. But it's Jeffree Star's Twitter replying to one of his posts saying, bad boy, with a link to is anyone up. Now, like I said before, is anyone up is no longer available. It got taken down by the motherfucking FBI. <laughs> But when you plug this link into the Wayback Machine, the Internet Archive, the video isn't there, but it's basically like everything except the video. Like you can see all the information about the post. And it was posted on the same day, March 16, 2011, that Jeffrey's tweet was made. Given that, it's highly likely that Jeffrey uploaded this video himself, as it was posted on the same day he added the guy on Twitter. Now, if you're wondering what he could possibly gain by doing this, I don't blame you because I was wondering that too. So I began to look for an answer. Why would Jeffrey Star upload pictures of straight men. Some of them are even of them having sex. I am disgusted. I'm not gonna post the full picture on YouTube because it's porn, but it really made me think why would he do this? What, what was the reason? So I began searching for an answer and I stumbled across this Snapchat from him. Because I have dirt on everyone and they know to keep their mouths shut. This bronze is really orange, fuck. Uh, anyway, so watching that Snapchat with this new information in mind, I kind of connected the dots in my head. Is this the dirt he was talking about? Because I have dirt on everyone and they know to keep their mouths shut. Hi, rapist. Hi, how are ya? Basically saying, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to post your porn. Or even worse, I'm going to post the porn of us. So people are going to think, you know, you're gay. But the story about Jeffrey's involvement with this website doesn't end there. Now, the founder and owner of this website is named Hunter Moore. The story about the fall of his empire goes like this. According to Wikipedia, one of the mother-in-laws of one of the victims of this website spent about a year gathering information about the website and its creators, to which she eventually forwarded to the FBI. The FBI later took over the investigation and Hunter Moore and a few other people were found guilty. Hunter Moore was sentenced to 14 years in prison but only served two. Now Hunter Moore actually released an autobiography about kind of the story of Is Anyone Up and like him going to fucking prison or something. The book is called Is Anyone Up? The Story of Revenge Porn. It was released in 2018. Now in this book he actually accuses Jeffree Star of some pretty heavy things. This book mysteriously vanished off of the virtual shelves of Amazon. There was an ebook available but they're no longer selling the ebook for some apparent reason. Now, I did manage to find screenshots of the part I'm going to talk about in a YouTuber called Sloan's YouTube video. Shout out to her. So this is a passage from Hunter Moore's book. Right now, there is all this drama with those beauty YouTube critics. My girlfriend is obsessed with them, and I love drama, so I low-key keep up with it. Anyways, this is awesome because I've known Jeffrey for a long time. He's like a cockroach with internet fame. Roaches! just jumping from one ship to the next. He can be successful at anything he gets into because he looks fucking weird. He's a pussy little drag queen with tattoos and acts like he's black even though he hates black people but I guess that's old news at this point. I met that drag queen when I was barely 18. Oh yeah, one more thing is this guy's clearly homophobic. 
Leave the gays alone. And the way he writes is giving me Bella La Throne vibes. Skipping ahead to a different paragraph. Jeffrey randomly gets up and goes to his room. And then I hear Hunter come here. I want to show you something. Do come here. I am like, uh, what the fuck? I get up and go to his room. This dude's room is super pink and white with hella stuffed animals on the bed. He goes, come here and sit on the bed. I walk over to it with a beer. Like, sort of like laughing like. I'm sorry, you guys. At this point, I'm not too sure if it's my dyslexia or his. Ooh. Like, sort of like laughing like, uh, this is fucking weird. This is a grown-ass man with a pink room and stuffed animals. No. Anyways, he acts like he is going to, like, come near me, but he puts his hand under his super gay pink pillowcase and pulls out this huge fucking butcher knife. Nani? I get up and I'm like, yo, what the fuck, and gets up off the bed. He goes, don't be scared, I just want to suck it. Why won't you let me suck it? Are you scared? He puts his hand out and is coming towards me. In my head, I think this is a joke, so I'm like, uh, and he had shut the door earlier when I walked in. So I get pushed up next to the door. Once he has me up against the door, he goes, why won't you let me suck it? And hits the door next to my head hard as his little gay arms can swing that butcher knife. Like a scene from The Shining kind of a super gay and not an hex. Hi, how are ya? <laughs> He does it again and again. I am low-key freaking out, but laughing, you know. And then Damie from The Millionaires comes in the room and goes all laughing and shit like I'm not about to be murdered. OMG, what are you guys doing? I was like, dude, he's mad. I won't let him suck dick and he's trying to kill me. He's all motherfucker. I knocked out a dude 10 times bigger than you at the club last night and then prances to his other pillow to pull out a taser and starts acting like he's gonna hit me with it. I throw the beard down and I told him, your little faggot ass wants to try and hit me with that. I'm knocking you the fuck out. I knew he didn't want to try me and get embarrassed in front of all his stuffed animals. No, skipping ahead to another paragraph. He would try and rip and get too touchy. I'd have to get mad. Well, I won't say his name because he's pretty famous now, but another dude I lived with wanted to be famous so bad. Jeffrey pulled the butcher knife out on him and basically ripped him with the butcher knife to his throat and he did it to his friends a few weeks ago i don't know i mean being a racist drag queen is bad enough but when you're out here ripping straight dudes with a butcher knife and they usually let you do it for some sort of clout for their band i don't know man you got some shit sort of fucked up this is crazy. Okay, a lot to unpack. On Twitter, Jeffrey actually has a lot of sexual tweets adding, is anyone up, presumably Hunter Moore. So this kind of confirms their interaction to be at least a little bit sexual. It's not my job to accuse Jeffree Star of anything. I'm not a lawyer. I'm just putting out there what is in this book that got taken down. For scholarly purposes, of course. Now, another thing I wanted to bring up in my notes is the potential connection this all has to Davi. Now, those of you that don't know, Davi was one of Jeffree Star's like people he like made music with or whatever. There's this whole big kind of discussion about it right now because there are literally tens of girls coming forth saying Davi did weird things to them when they were literally 11. It's really sick and disgusting. Oh shit, I forgot I'm doing my makeup. Ooh. So Jeffree Star recently did an interview with Chris Henson, the How to Catch a Predator guy, and I talked about this in the last video as well because Jeffree was very close to Davi. I'm not going to get into that too much because I addressed in the last video. Now, basically in that interview, Jeffrey said he didn't know anything. This is definitely strange or unlike him because he has literally admitted to strategically holding information about other people in order to later exploit it if he needs to threaten or blackmail them. Because I have dirt on everyone and they know to keep their mouths shut. So it's definitely interesting to hear him say that he has dirt on everyone, yet a person that he was around so often back in the day who would literally hang out with 11 year olds backstage, he doesn't know anything when he claims to know so much about other people. Interesting. The fact that Jeffree Star says he doesn't know anything has caused a lot of people to speculate. A lot of people are speculating the reason why Jeffree isn't really being helpful in this investigation or saying anything about him is because Davi has things to say about Jeffree. Now, I'm not accusing Jeffree every star of anything. But I did find a tweet that someone made back in 2013. It reads, at Hunter Moore, which is the guy whose book I just read to you, lol, at Jeffree Star still has me blocked for posting those pictures of him hooking up with a 14 year old fan on Warp Tour. Girl. This is crazy. And I'm not accusing Jeffree Star of anything, but all I gotta say is birds of a feather flock together. I don't really have any creepy friends because I'm not a creepy person. She's got a point. I'm not accusing him, but I'm acknowledging the fact that he has never publicly denied or defended himself against this allegation. And this entire situation was exacerbated and made worse by the fact that the entire Chris Henson interview was just an attempt by Jeffree Star to wash his hands of the entire situation. Now, the last little morsel of tea I'd like to share with you comes from a person that DM
damned me named Jocelyn. So Jocelyn previously went by Carmen and she actually opened for Blood on the Dance Floor back in 2014. So she had close contact with these people, including Jeffrey. Now this is the only thing within this video you won't be able to publicly verify yourself, but I'll put all the screenshots on the screen. She gave me full permission to share it with you. So back in 2013, I was hired into a band that was a frequent opener for Blood on the Dance Floor. And after I was, I began getting all these interconnections with people who knew Jeffrey, Davi, and Jay on both a professional and personal level. This was all pre-JSC, Jeffrey Star Cosmetics era, so Jeffrey was still very much underground. Well, in his interview with both Chris Henson and Davi, he blatantly lied and said he made the last song and washed his hands of them, which is not true at all. The tea is exceptionally good today. Leading up to July 1st, which was the only date I opened for them, there was a ton of planning behind the scenes, as any tour has. And I had a lot of people show me emails, as well as voice conversations, that Jeffree Star was initially planning to go back on tour with them for the 2014 Bitchcraft Tour. It was a common tradition and pattern they did together, where they would collab and then tour. So last minute, he backed out because the Damien story began gaining traction, and Jeffrey wanted to cover his ass and jump train. He talked about how they never hardly hung out, which was also very untrue. Jay also lied about their relationship because it was a well-known fact they were very close back in the day. I sadly don't have much more receipts than that, but I am an eyewitness to all of these things and really think people need to focus on this topic more than anything because it is a pure act of evil how he handled Damien. So she is referring to Damien Lionheart, one of Davi's previous victims. They went to him for help. He promised they would back them up and then later turned on them, working with their abuser again as well as adding on to their trauma by mocking them on Twitter by saying things like, girl, you done goof. So there's a very infamous video. It's actually a meme video that went viral a while ago. At the time, Damien was 11. They basically went on camera and they were crying, crying, crying when they started to accuse Davi of some of these things. She was bullied at her school and on the internet to the point where she filmed a breakdown. And her father basically appears in the background of the video at one point and says, you done goofed to like the people that were making fun of her. Now, Jeffrey actually mocked her in a tweet by saying, girl, you done goofed. Now that's bullying. Did you see that? I would have fans tell me how rude and inappropriate Jeffrey would be towards male fans back in the day. And they would always say to me, oh my God, you're like him, but actually nice. And it would always make the red flags go up in my head. There's even a video of him still on YouTube of him straight up grabbing a man's crotch with no permission and pretty much sexually assaulting him in broad public. Oh, I knew it was big. All these things connect and why more people aren't talking about this, I will never understand. So that was an exclusive personal testimony from a person that, that opened for Blood on the Dance Floor in 2014. Very good tea. So that's pretty much all of the tea and all of the field work, everything I've collected. Now let's actually get into the core of this video. What does all this actually mean? While I was writing my notes for this video, I thought of the term internet archaeology. Now, I love that for me because archaeology is a form of anthropology, but also archaeology involves digging things up, which is what so many of the Jeffree Stans accused me of doing in the last video, digging things up. And I'm so creative like that. The tea at the beginning was basically the carrot on the stick. Now let's have a real conversation about cancel culture and also the star family and the cultural mechanisms within. Like I stated earlier, the first video I did on this topic got way more attention than I previously anticipated. It got attention from every single kind of person, a Jeffree Star supporter and a person who's critical of Jeffree Star or a person in the middle. Now, I have read pretty much every single comment on that video. I know it's not healthy to do that. You mad doggy, you mad doggy. But I wanted to understand what people who were opposed to my way of thinking were saying. The biggest criticism I got was that I'm digging stuff up or this generation is so overly sensitive. Now, I definitely agree in some way. We do live in a time of a lot of PC wokeness. You know, I'm not going to deny that, but I want to talk about the logic behind calling someone like me and a lot of people that find this stuff serious over sensitivity. Now, a lot of people say that the whole lipstick Nazi thing and a lot of the other points I brought up in the previous video were done uh, because it was just so fucking trendy to be racist back then. Well, maybe if she wasn't wearing the wrong foundation color, I wouldn't have to splash no battery acid. I wanted to lighten her skin tone, girl. <laughs> so funny. Now, if I'm being 1000% honest, that is true in a different sense. The internet was a very different time back then. And a lot of people were a little bit more ignorant back then. However, I'd like to remind you of something I always find myself saying to people. Not all ignorant people make racist jokes, but all racists will make racist jokes. She's got a point. The reason why people take these racist jokes and actions so seriously is because they raise a red flag. You can think of that as oversensitivity, but I and a lot of other people think of that as perception. It's called dog whistle. 
whistling. Only certain people can hear dog whistles, but that doesn't mean they're not there. Now, the reason why a lot of people are divided or not too sure what to think about this whole racist humor, racist joke, racist artwork thing, you know, that excuse that a lot of creators from that time era seem to use, is because humor and irony is actually very ambiguous. One of my favorite YouTubers, Contra Points, talks about this in her video about how to recognize a fascist. Basically, the ambiguous nature of humor can actually be a very safe way of experiencing ideas and feelings you're not fully comfortable owning yet. Basically the whole, oh, it's a joke, calm down, snowflake excuse. But under the guise of humor and artwork, it allows individuals to say or do racist things. And when confronted about it later, all they have to do is say, oh, it was a joke or oh, it was for the purposes of art. We're saying this as the sick, stupid skit we filmed. Mm -hmm. And now, 13 years later, it has morphed into Jeffrey tells women of color that they need to lighten their skin tone and he's gonna throw acid on every girl. It can be the perfect way to express ideas you actually feel very strongly about. So when someone says a racist joke, there is no really way to determine from that alone whether or not they mean it or not. That's why it's best just to not make racist jokes. <laughs> now come on now. Because making racist jokes raises red flags. So once a red flag is raised, you know now you need to pay attention to this individual's actions to determine if they truly are racist, homophobic, a Nazi, whatever. That being said, take a look at this TikTok that I found. This is my super brief story time of when I met Jeffree Star at Warped Tour in San Francisco in 2009. This is what Jeffree looked like back then. That's still a look. And that's what Jeffree was doing. It's not an interesting story time. It's pretty much like everyone else's experience. But in 2009, Jeffree Star was still very comfortable saying N-I-G-G-E-R like in videos with friends in public. And he didn't say that to like me. I don't think he said that to anyone at Warped Tour, but he would not take photos with me and my black friends. He was doing paid photos, I think, but like we couldn't even get a ticket. I don't know if anyone remembers 303, but they were there too. And they also would not take pictures with black people. Pretty much no one was good back then, and they haven't really changed. I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for you meddling kids. I mean... Uh... Let me ask the audience. You know what they say, the proof's in the pudding. Another thing I wanted to bring up is how many comments I got downplaying the actual issue of racism. So many people were acting like racism is just not a big deal anymore. They were acting as if there's no reason to be offended by any of this stuff, and if you are, you're a millennial snowflake. It's funny they said that, only for two weeks later, Black Lives Matter to be reignited and literally set the nation on fire. Now, obviously, racism and racial inequality is still a huge problem, so it shows that a majority of the people defending these actions were people that came from privilege. And I think that's safe to assume considering the fact that I have never in my life ever heard a person of color say that racism is not real. Among a lot of the comments I received in defense of Jeffrey, there seems to be a common theme of blissful ignorance, given the fact that they're acting like racism is not a problem. But it is not blissful ignorance of the current social climate or situation. It is actually blissful ignorance of their own privilege. This is evident in the way they are so quick to forgive him. The whole, oh, he apologized, get over it thing is just an example of how they don't actually understand the lasting impact of these actions. It appears to me that they believe a simple apology on an Instagram story or a tweet is enough and honestly though you can't blame them some things cannot be learned they have to be experienced so you can't really blame them for not fully understanding the issue of racism right off the bat because they've never experienced it but what you can blame them for is not listening and attempting to invalidate opinions when they have no place in this social discourse oh my god you guys the racist comments in the last video were so bad it was almost funny um ciao anyway so Another thing I wanted to bring up is the fact that I was around that stuff and I had a lot of friends that were really into that stuff, you guys, like so hardcore into that. Like I remember in middle school and even high school, I had this one friend that literally would not shut up about Pierce the Veil. You know, I wasn't really a scene kid. It was definitely something that had an impression on me growing up. <laughs> I was around a lot of those people and I never said any of these horrible things. They never said any of these horrible things either. And it was always, it was never like if you were in the scene, you were automatically racist or not a sympathizer. The edginess, if anything, is a personal aesthetic and style, not a personality trait. Because honestly, whoever said that people that look like this, like the scene kids, whoever said that they're gonna be edgy, honestly, a lot of them are really, really sweet. Those are the kind of bitches that stand up for you when they see people being homophobic. Did I lie? Did I lie? 
So I just popped some lashes on. So a theory I have is that his supporters' constant rejection and disdain of cancel culture is actually a projection of their own inner guilt, as they potentially may have made the same mistakes and did the same wrong things that he has. That's why they take every criticism of Jeffrey so personally, because when you criticize his behavior, they see it as you criticizing their own past behavior. That's also why they will viciously attack anyone that goes against Jeffrey. Did I just find the reason why people stand? Period. That's why opinions on Jeffrey Star are currently so divided, because the people that defend him are not actually defending him, but they're merely defending his actions. And that's because the people who have made similar mistakes as him find comfort in his presence on the platform. And as a result, you end up in a situation we're in now, where for some reason this individual appears to be untouchable. And it's because simply a lot of his followers don't want to hear it. Not because they just don't want to hear it, because when they hear it, it makes them feel guilty themselves, potentially. Okay, so the makeup is done. Wow. Alright, so let's actually get into the thing I want to talk about the most. Now, I've been sitting on this theory for a while. I've never fully articulated it, but this video gave me the perfect excuse to do that. I originally thought of this theory two semesters ago when I needed to write a final for my speech 101 class. I ended up doing it on something else. I honestly don't remember. But this argument is both in defense and against cancel culture. Girl, what the fuck is you talking about? Allow me to explain. Ooh. Cancel culture is an umbrella term that explains multiple different immune responses on the internet. I call this theory the cyberkind storm theory. For those of you that don't know, a cytokine storm is an immune response your body has that can actually kill you. It's like a really harsh and inflamed immune response. So my little theory states cancel culture is the immune system of the internet. It's what allows us to purge malignant entities we no longer want in our body or within the body of the internet. Now there are two main things people talk about when they're referring to cancel culture. One is true cancel culture and the other one is problematic culture. There's a difference between the two. In recent times people have been saying cancel culture is extremely toxic and we need to completely get rid of it. And I do agree, it almost feels as if the immune system has an autoimmune disease as it's attacking the very things it should be protecting, which are marginalized creators. But when we actually analyze it, the steps for cancellation, the actual process, and the results occur in two different categories. One is true cancel culture and the other one is the problematic culture. Allow me to explain the latter. Put your seatbelts on. Problematic culture basically results in a person being labeled as problematic. It's basically the result of bitching. Ooh. Now, when you label someone as problematic, they are not necessarily canceled, as true cancel culture strips of an individual of their social privileges and power. This is important. We will talk about that in just a second. On this platform, it seems that almost like 80% of all creators have been labeled as problematic, and there's a reason for that. The problematic label is extremely ambiguous. It provides a justification for people not to personally like someone. I would know this because I was being called problematic in the comment section of my last video, and a lot of people still call me problematic right now. Even though I've never done anything illegal, I've never truly offended any marginalized audience, and I don't think I ever will because I'm not like that, people call me problematic, yet I've done nothing wrong. And if we pay attention to a lot of other people that are called problematic, we can see this pattern. For example, a lot of people call Manny MUA problematic, or they call Laura Lee problematic. What has Manny MUA and Laura Lee actually done within the past year that is scandal worthy? Probably nothing. I would like to see it. People use that label of problematic as a pseudo justification for not personally liking someone. Because when you say someone is problematic, it's not referring to their actions, it's referring to them personally, their personality. And as I said earlier, it really doesn't take much to be labeled as problematic. Even having a mildly annoying voice <laughs> Problematic culture is definitely very toxic. It provides inappropriate reasons to act as if someone is canceled when in reality you're just saying you don't personally like them. Whereas true cancel culture is the harshest immune response the internet can have. For example, what happened with Kevin Spacey and R. Kelly canceled the house. And guess where he going? To prison! Even though hashtag cancel Jaclyn Hill and hashtag cancel R. Kelly use the same word, cancel, just a different name, they're completely different in meaning. And that's because the meaning of canceled is not the same in this context. In order for someone to be canceled truly, there needs to be a violation of common decency or something illegal that occurs. With R. Kelly, you are trying to strip him of his privileges that the internet provides, which is canceling. It's the emergency response of the internet to strip someone's privileges away when they've clearly been misused 
using them to violate common decency or do illegal things. And it's not only criminals that deserve to be cancelled. Like I said, it's a violation of common decency that can get you cancelled. For example, Jake and Logan Paul, the Paul brothers. They're both cancelled the house because Logan, the long hair one, I think, posted that video of him in the suicide forest with a dead body hanging in the background. That's not just being problematic, that's violating common decency, as most people would find the image of a dead body highly offensive and disgusting. Whereas his brother Jake Paul recently during the George Floyd protests was seen in what appears to be a closed mall attempting to loot a store. That right there is not only fucked up, but it's also illegal. illegal. So in defense of cancel culture, true cancel culture, one of the two things, you can't blame the tool itself for the way people misuse it. However, problematic culture is extremely toxic. Now there is another part to this theory. It's actually kind of like a separate theory on its own. Um, so I call it the Jafar starfish theory. <gasps> Basically this theory states that whenever someone is beginning to be cancelled, the same steps will always occur. First the allegation or discussion will begin. Then from there they will either upload an apology or a statement video. Now let's build upon the second step because that's extremely important. 100% of the time when someone is responding to a scandal that is attempting to cancel them, it will always be a persuasive based argument. They're either persuading you to forgive them or persuading you what happened it didn't actually happen. And there's three tactics you can use in persuasion, ethos, logos, and pathos. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that before in high school English, but for those of you that may have forgotten, ethos is ethical persuasion, logos is logical persuasion, and pathos is emotional persuasion. But what they don't tell you is not all of them are created equal. Pathos is the weakest method of persuasion as your feelings can be easily invalidated by logic and ethics. So my theory, the Jafar Starfish theory, is that during step two, depending on which of the three tactics in persuasion you use will determine whether or not you are cancelled. Ethos and logos based persuasion will usually result in the individual not being cancelled, whereas pathos 99% of the time will result in cancellation. Now pathos is emotional persuasion, it's relying on people's sense of empathy to persuade them. That is why the most emotional apology videos, for example Laura Lee crying on the couch, <laughs> where it is purely pathos-based persuasion, her begging you to forgive her. That is why that video is literally such a meme, because it's hated so much. Pathos-based persuasion will always, always, always and forever, result in cancellation or at least damaging the individual. Let's apply this theory to a past scenario. So step one is Tati made the allegation against James Charles, you know, blah 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 gummy bears. <laughs> <laughs> From there, James posted his first apology video, the- I, for, I forgot what it's called. Oh. <laughs> okay. But that video pretty much exclusively contains pathos-based persuasion. He's relying on your sense of empathy to give him a second chance, and unfortunately, according to this theory, that doesn't work. That's why after he posted that first video, it appeared he was losing. <laughs> Then he came out with the second video, the No More Lies video. Now that video was an excellent decision because it was purely ethos and logos based persuasion, which are the two you want to use. Basically, he was spitting facts and dropping receipts. Now that's how you clear a bitch! And that was very smart of him to do as it negated cancellation and backed his opposition into a corner. His opposition being Jeffree Star because at this point, honestly, Tati probably don't, didn't give a shit anymore. And after James posted that video, Jeffrey posted an Instagram story saying that video was full of lies and manipulation and he will soon come out with the real truth. But there are so many things that you guys don't know. If you've been following me for a long time, you know me. Two hours later. Jeffree Star is not Jeffrey from 10 years ago. Pick a side, pick a side. So we were all under the impression that Jeffrey had the receipts and he was going to expose the truth only for him to come out with that lame ass apology video. Now when you actually analyze that video, it's purely pathos based persuasion, it's just a bunch of crap. And that's a common theme with a lot of Jeffree Star's update or apology videos. Think about the racism video for example. He is basically begging you to trust him again, but just in a way where you don't realize it. And ever since he posted that, you know, never doing this again video, people have begun to simply not like him or call him problematic and the situation we're in now the beginning signs of cancellation started after he posted that video. Now another part of the cyberkind storm theory I want to mention now is that just like your own body, there can be cancers that develop. An example of this on YouTube would be Jeffree Star, but an example outside of YouTube would be someone like Donald Trump. The allegations and reasons for cancellation continue to pile up, but it's as if our immune system is not kicking in. Just like in your own body, sometimes tumors can go under the radar of your own immune system. And how do we treat the tumor? Well, the same way we treat the tumor 
customers in real life. Internet chemotherapy, if you will. Videos like this are the internet chemotherapy, not the immune system. And I know video exposés like this aren't always pleasant to watch. Just like chemotherapy in real life, the process is not always pleasant. In fact, it's very unpleasant. However, it is done in order to completely halt or negate the growth of the cancer or tumor. Done in hopes to allow the immune system, aka cancer culture, to begin functioning properly again. This video is not an attempt to cancel Jeffree Star at all. If anything, I'm here to give you the tools you need to know in order to dismantle manipulative rhetorics. For example, he responded to these allegations of the lipstick not thing in Sebastian Williams' video of it. He basically went from saying, oh, that website never existed, to saying, oh, it was my friend's website, to then saying, oh, it was my makeup blog. What? Literally changing the story three times in the same message doesn't really look good. Yikes. This ain't it, chief. Friendly reminder that this isn't a good look. But then he goes in to say, I'm not comfortable addressing anything involving self-harm, which is a perfectly understandable response. Now also when looking on the Wayback Machine, you can see some very, very dark imagery of Jeffree Star. However, Jeffree Star's DM to me did say that he was not comfortable discussing in any way, shape, or form. That's perfectly understandable. However, that isn't necessarily what we're talking about here. Because when you actually dismantle that response and apply logical thinking, for example, in one of the blog posts, he says he has over 25 million page views and 625 followers, to which he acknowledges them as teens, which means impressionable youth. Now, in the first video, when I suggested that he was glamorizing self-harm, a lot of people said it's his own thing. He can make whatever art he wants out of it. It's not my fucking trauma. It's not my problem. But what is my problem is the fact that on the same blog, he was posting pictures of other people doing that to themselves. He would repost pictures people would send him of his name carved into their arm. And underneath those posts, he would say things like, oh, this makes me feel so loved, yada, yada, yada. The main reason why people were so upset about that is because it's indirectly encouraging people he acknowledged himself as young, impressionable teens to potentially do that to themselves, send it to him in order to be noticed by their fate. My logical counter argument to the statement that I don't want to talk about this is that's completely fine, but we're not talking about that. Your own history with self-harm is your own trauma, but how do you want to explain once you begin to post other people's pictures of it and encouraging other people to do the same? How do you want to say you hate cancel culture, yet you've literally threatened to destroy people using it? Because I have dirt on everyone and they know to keep their mouths shut. According to the theory I spoke about earlier, this video is not actually an attempt to cancel Jeffree Star. If anything, it's an attempt to strip away his invulnerable and untouchable status. So if he genuinely believes he did nothing wrong, he has nothing to worry about. However, if he and the Star family feels threatened by this video, that shows that they know something was wrong. And it shows how much they actually rely on that unfair, untouchable status in order to preserve his innocence and image. In this period. So far, he isn't handling it that well. I mean, he did block me after the first video instead of actually addressing it. <laughs> you fool! I have 70 alternative accounts! <laughs> And I think this video is coming to an end. Let me know if you guys would like to see more internet archaeology or just philosophical, anthrop anthropological, whatever, get ready with me. Give me any suggestions you have, but my area of expertise is religious and cultural anthropology. But yes, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye. I'm so creative like that. <laughs> so we gotta come up with something really quick.